Well, we are currently on the topic of uh, mothers. Um, I mean, um, well, we just finished the topic of wives loving their, their husbands. Uh, look at verse 4. It says, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands. Um, and then, number 2, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Today we'll be looking at what it means to love uh, their children. Uh, just, but just as a review, um, the word loving husband and loving children, has they have the same reconstruction, the same prefix uh, with phylos, and then for, for the man it will be andros, and then for the children is technos, and so it's just attached. The word love is just attached to that particular word referring to a husband and, and children, and the idea is, in one sense, that the love of the mother to the husband and the children are, in one sense, the same. As we made it clear last week, it's not agape love, the highest and supreme form of love, uh, where it's, like a, it, it's more of like a God-like love toward man, his son, uh, our love toward God, um, a husband's love for his wife. The kind of love mentioned here in verse 4 has to do more with a, a visible presentation of her love for her husband. And so in this sense, it would be, for the children, a visible love, that, that uh, a, visible sense, a visible type of love for the mother to her children that they can visibly see and maybe emotionally feel uh, that love from their, their mom. The clearest manner uh, in which a wife can be a lover of her husband is simply this, that she would grow in her godliness. She would become spiritual. That she would become one who is devoted to God. But even as I say that, you have to understand, there are people in this world who just don't understand what that means. You tell someone, be as spiritual as you can, and then, and then they try to go off and try to apply that in some weird manner. Uh, by praying five hours a day, by neglecting their children and doing quiet time or whatnot, and then you start realizing that the world, the reason why there's so many self-help books and Christian books written on this topic is because people just don't have wisdom. Wisdom to simply hear a principle and then apply it. Okay? Um, I thought it was easy to just see that, okay? but it's not. Um, to, to hear wisdom or principle from the scriptures and then apply it in your daily life. And I think one of the reasons why that's the case is because there's no necessity today or no need for meditation. It's just one thing after another. You're just going at it. Waking up, making breakfast, going to work, coming home, or if you have children, waking up, feeding them, taking care of them, taking them to school. And then the moment you have rest, you're on your phone looking through some news, trying to keep updated with what's going on, looking up some uh, shopping stuff or Amazon or whatnot, or listening to some music. There are, there, no one today, in the, in the most gen, gen, general sense, okay, are spending time meditating. Okay? Meditating, chewing on God's Word, thinking deeply about what they have learned, and writing down particular applications that the Holy Spirit is leading them to do. How many of you guys uh, have, have had this experience where you're listening to a sermon, and this particular thing comes to your mind, that you should do this or get rid of that. Yeah, you should be writing that down. But not immediately applying it though. Because it's at the whim. You just thought of it. What you need to do is jot it down and then go home and uh, think more deeper about this in, in terms of, is this really from the Lord? Is this really applicable? What do I need to actually do in order to obey the Holy Spirit as He moves me? Most people will listen have those thoughts, and then forget to write it down, and on their way out, they completely forget what they thought about or what the Holy Spirit spoke to them during that time. And, and that's why you need to take notes. Okay? You need to write notes down. Now, you don't copy every single thing down. You write down the things that come to your mind as you listen to that text. But again, you, you will see people in the United States or, or just anywhere you go, Christians who just don't get it. There's no wisdom. 
you know, you, you kind of expect it, but you don't see it. And, and next thing you know, they're, they're, they're locked onto this one particular child raising book, and they have to do it this way. Because it lays out literal blueprint and a skeleton structure of what their home is supposed to look like, as opposed to applying the scripture on their own at home. Now, are there wisdom in, uh, fi- do you find, can you find wisdom in those literature? Yes, there's, I, I'm not denying the fact that you should read those books. There's a lot of good things that you can learn. But the point is, as we look at this text, if you think about it, look how brief verse 4 and 5 are. It's just, love your husband, love your children, uh, be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husband so that the word of God will not be dishonored. There's nothing else written. And if we were living in Crete, we would not have the whole New Testament. We would par- probably have only Titus and maybe Ephesians, which was circulated. Just those two manuscripts with the Old Testament, maybe in the synagogue somewhere, and we have to read this and apply these things. Now last week, we took a whole hour to go other places in the scripture to see what the scripture says. In that sense, we're so blessed and we have such an abundant amount of information. But what would you do if this is all you have? Will you be forced to sit and meditate? What does that mean? Love my husband. What does this mean to love my what? Children. What does it mean to be sensible? To think deeply about that word. You'll be asking yourself, am I being sensible? Do I have, am I showing sense with my time? Do I work at home? Am I submissive? Am I kind? You you sit down and you really dig deep into this principle and the Holy Spirit begins to illuminate your mind, helping you to understand what particular things you need to do. But today, it's not like that. That's why sometimes we have to go so slow with the text because we have to look at other parts of the text to help you see what particular applications you know you need to make. And the most practical things are found in Proverbs 31. We went through that you know, last week. You know, things like waking up early, that's a very practical way of loving your husband. You know, I, I remember uh, Professor Felix uh, uh, telling us you know, uh, for our eight o'clock a Greek class. Uh, they called it baby Greek, but it was more like mutant Greek, like some monster Greek. It was just, you know, a whole year's worth of Greek in you know, five weeks. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, to get ready f- to teach us, he said he had to get up at five. Um, and and his, he says, yeah, every day will be like, oh, my poor wife, she, she's waking up at four to get ready for me while I'm getting up to get ready to go to you. And it's kind of telling us that don't just appreciate him, but we should be thankful for him, you know, for his wife. You know, why, why would a woman do that? Well, because her husband knows Greek and knows the actual intent of the scriptures. Well, it's in Proverbs 31, is in Hebrew, but it says that she rises up early, she feeds her whole household, all the maidens, all the workers, and then she sleeps late at night, so she's barely getting any sleep. But What I'm saying is that's what scripture says about what it means to be a Proverbs 31 woman. Now, as always, the motivation is the most important thing, okay? If you forget the motivation, then everything turns into, uh, you know, turns into grudge, drudgery. It it turns into, uh, oh man, I gotta do this again. The attitude for all women and men is to be the glory of, of God, okay? The glory of God, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the glory of what? Of God, okay? God always comes first. It's not about marital happiness. It's not about self-fulfillment. It's not about self-esteem. It's not about personal upbringing with family values, trying to make your family a certain you know, idealistic manner. It's God who is to be glorified, and the wife, in this particular context, is to want the glory of God to be expressed through her actions toward her husband and toward her children. Now there are seven clear commands for women. Number one, love your husband. Number two, love children. 
Number three, be sensible. Number four, be pure. Number five, be a worker at home. Number six, be kind. Number seven, be submissive to your own husband. What is the result of a woman who lives these seven things out? Will she receive a greater blessing from God? Will she receive honor from the church? Will she be loved, more loved by her husband? I will say yes, but the primary goal here is in verse 5, that she will not dishonor the word of God. Okay? She will not dishonor the word of God. And that applies to both men and women. Anytime we try to do something that is contra scripture, that is not biblical, we are making it clear to the world that the scriptures contain no wisdom and that God's word is not trustworthy and therefore we dishonor his word. Okay? We dishonor his word. Again, I mentioned meditation. If you don't go home and start planning out the week to spend time meditating, you are dishonoring God's word. Why? Psalm chapter 1. On his law, he meditates, what, day and night. So it's there clearly to indicate that this is something God wants us to do. When we hear the fact that we need to be, we need to take, we need to take some time to meditate, and we go throughout the week rationalizing, I'm just so busy, I can't do this, you are dishonoring the word of God. In fact, you're telling everyone, it's okay to disobey God's word. You know, today on the way down, well, I just at least for the past couple of weeks, it's just been so uh, busy. And you know, when you get tired, you don't want to listen to a, a long, draw, drawn out sermon. Um, and I was listening to MacArthur, and I just droned, it's just the sound just droned out in the background. And I realized it wasn't helping, so I, you know, shut it off, played some music, and that wasn't helping because the music, whatever words were there, were driving my thoughts towards that. I decided this, this might be the time to just start meditating. You know, driving on the freeway, turn everything up and just start meditating and praying, thinking about a particular thought of the scripture toward God and, and, and letting it dwell in my mind for more than a blip, okay, more than a few seconds. Why should a woman obey these things? It is because she will not dishonor the word of God and she will show everyone that if a woman does these things that God is praised and he will inevitably bless that family and the work of her hands. Now, let's head into the whole subject of loving one's children um, uh, for, for the mothers. Now, the text says clearly to love their children. As I told you before, the Greek construction is basically the same as the one with the husband, Philo Technos. Okay? A technos is, for, is a general word for children. It can actually apply to older children. If you go to Titus 1, verse 6, where it talks about children of elders believing. As we made it clear last, the last time we were here, these are not young children. Uh, these are children, according to the context, who are not accused of dissipation or rebellion. That sin of dissipation and rebellion cannot occur when they are toddlers or infants or or you know, junior high school children, these are grown children, teenagers or above, who are able to dissipate and rebel, to participate in sensuality and debauchery and drunkenness and sexual sins. So depending on the context, um, the word technos is it, general. Okay? The, let the, you have to let the context determine what age group you are looking at here. The mom is to simply love the children that God has given to her. And because it mentions husband, and because it mentions her children, and it mentions her home, the context indicates that these are younger children. Maybe babies, to toddlers, to infants, to kindergarten, to junior high. Young men, uh, uh, children, who are living under the care of, of the mom. Now, the, the, word, the, the word for love is the same as the word for uh, the loving her husband, as we made it clear last time, that it's a, when a wife loves her husband in that context, according to that lexical definition, it has to do with the wife attentively caring for the husband's needs. She sees what her husband needs and she fills it. She looks ahead, 
and she cares for him in that particular sense. In this sense, with the children, it's obvious, it obviously means that a mom is attentively caring and meeting the needs of the child. So while it can refer to the physical care of the children, but this word goes beyond that. I think it goes into the spiritual life, into their emotional life, basically loving their children in a complete and healthy sense. Now, what is the, what is the implication according to Titus chapter 2 with, with regards to this whole idea of adorning the doctrine of God? Well, I think it's pretty clear. What Titus is telling the church, or what Paul is telling the church to do, is that a wife is to be hourly known to be a lover of her children. Just in the same manner that she is publicly known as a lover of her husband, meaning it's just, it's just obvious when you see her interaction with her husband and her interaction with her children and her values and her priority and her efforts, it all goes into her husband first and then her children and everyone who observes this can obviously see that woman loves her children. You know, it's sad, my wife told me when she goes to get her hair cut, you know, salon, they have a, there's always this uh, generic uh, stereotype of them gossiping. And so, um, so my wife went to get her hair cut and uh, she being a mother of four children and the salon lady, uh, knowing that, uh, would tell her, wow, you know, you look so happy and you have four children. And she just would just bluntly say, yeah, I, yesterday I was cutting this lady's hair. She only had one child and she was just sad. She looked like she was miserable, you know, and then this lady miserable. And so it, it, that's the idea here. When, when a wife is to love their children, she can love them inside of her heart as much as she can. But because of that intense inner love, she hourly loves her children with the right biblical perspective. And then everyone can see, yes, she's involved in her children's life. Um, it, it's really easy to give off the impression that you don't love her husband, that you don't love your children, that you want something more. It, it's really, really easy. Okay? You can tell that about guys and their wives, you know, that they want something more than just what they have. Okay? Uh, and, and so th the idea here is that you okay, need to visibly reveal that you are concerned for your children, not well, I don't, when I, I don't want to say that we're concerned because that's more like a helicopter mom. You know, you're just always hovering. But that this mom truly loves her children um, before, before the Lord. Now, it's always easy to love one person and to, solve, and to serve one person. It's always hard to give that equal amount of attention to several groups of people. Because here, it tells the wife, that you need to love your husband and love your what? Children. You can't love one more than what? The other. Now the order is there. You, you, the priority is always the husband first, but it's not like you can neglect the children and give them less amount of love. The wife needs to know how to multitask her love. Okay? Uh, and, and give both groups equal amount of attention. They, they need to know, the husband needs to know, and the ch children need to know that their mom loves them with all of their heart, all of her heart. Secondly, notice that the text does not state that she should just babysit her children. It says she needs to love her children. Okay? Some mothers uh, get tired of loving their child unconditionally and now it's just a matter of babysitting. You know, with the help of the iPhone and the iPad, it is getting ridiculous where a mom will just hand that thing over and just say, be quiet. And it works. The child just loves to flip through this, this machine and, and is self-entertained and she can have her own time. Now, is it wrong? No, there's some time, there's some needs for that, but I'm just saying that there are mothers who no longer want to expressively love their children, they just want to babysit their children. And what's worse is today, they don't even see the need to babysit themselves, they would have someone else babysit their child, as if, 
that all that child needs is a babysitter. That's wrong. I mean, unless like the husband is dead or physically incapacitated to work and the mom has to go to work and, and none of the relatives or, or her, her siblings or church friends can take care of them, then at the, at the last, as a last resort, fine, find some way of providing child support. But they're looking at children as animals who have no emotion. In fact, they would care more for a dog's attitude and personality and a dog's emotional need than their own children. It, it is so sick. When you, see, when you see moms drop off their kids at, at daycare thinking as long as they, that child gets fed, they're going to physically grow. And then what? They're going to learn to just receive love on their own? No. You cannot leave your baby unloved. You must love your children. Your children. You see, Christian mothers at that time were so good at loving children that people would bring children that they, wouldn't, they would find on the streets because of this text. Because only Christian women they found actually love children. Do not, okay, do not ever think okay, because you have to live a certain economic status that you have to go to work and leave your child to someone else. You're going to reap the horrific consequences of that one way or another. That child will grow, that child will learn something, okay, but that child will not be protected under the sanctifying work of the mom, the work of the Holy Spirit through the mom. You'll be left for Satan to do whatever he wants to do with that child through someone else. And it's your fault. And so this is where guys need to pick up the slack and work hard, get the job that you need to get, get the pay that you need to get in order to provide for the family so that the wife doesn't feel threatened about a certain level of financial need. You need to get to work and do what you have to do to provide so that the child can stay home and be spiritually protected and loved by the mom. It doesn't say here that husbands have to love their children. I mean, that's expected, yes, but it tells the mom, the mom, the woman has to love their own child that God has given to them. And if nothing makes sense, just think about the design. God gave a woman the capability to carry the child in their womb, to deliver the child, and then the ability to feed the child. She gives the child her immune system, her uh, antibodies, and all of that in the first six months. It's amazing how God designed a woman to literally give herself to the baby. Her bones, her protein, her calcium, everything goes to that child. I was so shocked that my infant, my newborn, didn't require water because the mom would provide that through her breast milk. That his first time drinking water will be when he's weaned off. I, I was just blown away by this. So, so mothers must love their children. And when a young lady who has a child tenderly cares for her children, then she's fulfilling God's will for her life. Now, one question that we have to ask is, is it wrong not to want children? Okay, is it wrong not to, wrong, not to uh, want children? When someone says, I don't want children, I guess the first immediate response slash answer would be, why not? Like, why not? What, what is this motivation for not wanting children? Now, you know, there are some couples who, because they're married, they get married out of love, and they're not financially, you know, set. Both the husband and the wife needs to work for a little bit to just, just to just pay rent for a one-bedroom, you know, apartment. 
and they're they're just they're just living frugally and whatnot, and and they realize it, it, it's just financially impossible, and they wisely hold off just for a little bit, and decide to have children later. Now, is that wrong? No, I think that that is wise. We gotta understand something here. No matter how well you plan this, it, it will never go your way. Because right when you think you're gonna have a baby, you realize something's not right and the Lord withholds. And then sometimes you might have an oopsie baby, you know, and the baby's gonna come in, in nine months, and whether you like it or not, and you're not even financially there yet. The, the reason I'm saying this is because whether you plan or not, once you have a baby conceived, God steps in, okay? And He'll take care of everything. He will, okay? I've lived through this. I am a living, breathing example, okay? That God will provide the moment your wife gets what? Pregnant. So don't ever be scared, okay? Uh, to have children, okay? Um, I think like, you know, for Tatsu and Jin Wing, if I can just use them as an example, they're, it's, yeah, I think it's good that they're holding off because just the situation that they're in is almost impossible. But let's just imagine that Jin Wang just right now says, I think I'm pregnant. Well, the Lord's will has now been revealed that, and then even in that situation, He will actually what? Provide. Now, so you want to be wise, but at the same time, there's an aspect of faith where if you really want children, just try and let's see where the Lord will lead. Either way, when you start, when, you, when she's pregnant and you're about to give birth, the Lord will move all these things into your life where it will be provided for. So, what is the wrong motivation then? Well, if a, if a woman doesn't want children because she feels she hasn't lived her life, she wants to travel and see the world with her new boyfriend, who's her, who, I mean, her husband, who was her boyfriend, and she wants to experience life and, and go drinking here and go clubbing there now with her husband, and she wants to experience all of these things as a married woman, I will say that is absolutely sinful. I mean, if you have opportunity to travel, why not? But once you tell the Lord, I don't want a child because I have some bucket list that I need to fulfill, you are offending the Lord, you are grieving the Holy Spirit because He brought you into marriage so that you can procreate. Unless He decided that you're going to be childless. He made you to have children. You should want to have children. Young ladies should grow wanting to have children. It is just so sad today to see young ladies immediately saying, I don't like children, I don't want to take care of him, so and so, this and that, you know. And just having this dark, negative perspective of children. Turn with me to Genesis 1. For a few, sec for a few minutes, let's take a look at some theological perspective on children. From the very beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, and this was before sin, okay, Adam and Eve were given the command to have children. In chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, was Adam and Eve created solely for the purpose of procreation? Not solely, in the sense that that's all they had to do. I mean, they were able to enjoy that physical union without actually giving birth. And I think biologically, they say that it's the window, the time window frame for having the fertilized, um, uh, having the egg fertilized is so small, okay? That out of the month, there's only a few days where that's actually open. Okay? I just happen to hit it every time. Okay. But, you know, some people, they just miss it all the time or what, what not. Meaning God designed a woman not to always conceive. I mean, if that was the case, it would just be an endless, right? It would just be endless. Um, but did He create them to produce? Obviously, how else are they going to populate the, what? The earth. Now there's all this talk about overpopulation, you know, don't have more than one child. 
that is just baloney. That's what the world says, but they realize it's actually, it's actually backfiring on them. Okay, uh, that people are not having children, and now they're getting a, they're they're worrying about the next generation and how everybody's getting older, but there's really no younger people. And if there are, they're just not in their right mindset. They're not sensible. So when God created man and wife, man and woman, He told them, you are to procreate. It's a command. Be fruitful and what? Multiply. Now I don't think He left the command only for Adam and Eve to keep doing this until everybody's filling every nook and cranny of the earth. It's the general idea that from their children to their children's children and their other children, it, everything just starts multiplying. So it, I don't think it means that you have to go and have 10, 11, 15 children to to fulfill the word multiply. I have my, I, my our, I've multiplied. You know, I've got four, that's two times two, that's enough, you know? Okay? Uh, some people will have only one, some people have ten, some people three. You know, the number is not the issue. The issue is the attitude of the heart. To understand as a woman, you were created by God to create children, to have children. Okay? Again, I just want to make it clear, there are many women who cannot conceive. It could be the husband's physical physiology, it could be the wife's uh, physiology. Sometimes it's neither, they're both healthy, but the Lord for some reason is withholding, giving them a child, okay? But that does not mean, okay, that once, you know, that doesn't mean that, um, that, it, it, that you can just somehow decide, forget it, I'm, I just don't want children because I want to live my life. Once you're married, you must have that attitude of asking the Lord, please give us a children because we want to raise a child for the Lord. And turn with me to Gen uh, Psalm 127. Psalm 127. Generally speaking, okay, generally speaking, children are a blessing from God. It is a gift from the Lord. Okay? Psalm chapter 127 verse 3, it says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gates. You know, I, I've always wondered about that last phrase. You know, they will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. I, I, I think at that time, the, the gate was the place where many of the official things occurred. You know, the judgment and the ruling from the elders. I guess when you came and showed up with your whole family, you know, your armada, you know, Whatever, whatever enemy there were, or whatever, so, if there's someone that just doesn't like you, they just can't say much now that they see how blessed you are. It's, I think it's kind of like that. And I, I, fe I guess I feel this at times when I go to places and I have a lot of children, uh, and, and we just kind of, and people see that. Obviously we get glares like, I can't believe you, know, you would have that. And there's that kind of glare from people, but you know, when you kind of show up and you have your family next to you, your children, they love you. You just feel like this king, you know, like proud, you know, like, yeah, you know, I'm the man. And your enemies have nothing to say, especially when they only have one child. You know? and, and they realize whatever criticism they have of you, they can't say much when your children are just happy and, and playing around you. Now, I bet they're just waiting for them to become teenagers so that they can say, ah, you see, you know, what happens when you're like that? But here, children okay, are a gift from the Lord. Again, generally speaking, because not all couples will have children, but the idea here is that having children is an indication that the Lord has blessed your life. And when it says like arrows in the hand of a warrior, think about it. If you have one arrow, how is that helpful? Okay? Your quiver needs to be full of them. So I would encourage you, if the Lord wills, and if you desire so, at least have two, okay? Don't just have one, but try to have at least two. 
um, if the Lord wills. But it always mentions arrows, plural, okay? Children, plural. They are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the, of the womb is a reward. So if you get pregnant, the first thing you should say is, is praise God. You know, praise the Lord. I remember when we found out that Pauline was pregnant, we just got on our knees and said, thank you, Lord. Partially, I was saying desperately, Lord, help us. I, I don't know how I'm going to take care of uh, my family now, but, but it was like, it was a sign of God's favor on, on, on my wife and, and upon, upon me. Now, why, why are children so important though? Aside from the fact that they're cute, you know, bubbly, uh, and they need endless diapers. Why is it so important to have children? Well, before sin entered the world, when Adam and Eve would have a child, that child would have been sinless. They were to populate the world with righteousness. Not their righteousness, the righteousness of their children and their children's children. The world was supposed to be a kingdom of righteousness, of, of sinlessness, of, of progeny that were well uh, in a relationship with the Heavenly Father. But after sin, Eve produced a baby that would kill and lead others astray. And then she had to have another child to finally have someone more righteous. But her second child, uh, uh, Abel, had to die. So now you have a, have a situation where you're able to produce children. Not having children is not good because the world is filled with wicked people. Having children is another way of you producing at least one extra person on this planet who you will commit to in terms of raising them righteously so that they can be a salt and light to this world believing in God. It's a form of evangelism. You're burying an evangelist. To go to the world and be that salt and light. And we need lots of children who are raised in a righteous manner by mothers. You know, most of us here, I don't think, had godly moms. You know, or even some of us, we don't have believing moms. We're a few that the Lord graciously changed us and led us in this way, now the responsibility is falling on our shoulders as we're seeking to get married, as we're seeking to have children. It is a huge responsibility. Guys, just again, again it goes beyond just your family fence. Okay? It's not just you and your wife and how happy you are, and then it's not just you, your wife, and maybe a little baby, and just you three are just so cuddly and warm. It's about you and the world now. To have a child, you are having a, a human being who will be raised up under your care to be launched off into this world to do what was commanded of you in Matthew 28, to go and make disciples of all what? Nations. It is a huge long-term project that God has set you on by allowing you to become pregnant. But today, women don't take that seriously anymore. To them, it's just, can I just get my child to just eat their cereal and, and wipe the floor and, and wipe his nose and wash his hands? If he can just do that, I'm happy. Because young ladies are not wise in terms of how they care for their children. It's, it's, now you're just producing more sinners. We want to populate the world with people who are righteous. So, the question comes down at this time, how do you love one's child? How do you love one's, uh, one, your, how do you love your children? Well, number one, and these are just some verses that I'm, just, I'm going to throw out at you in, uh, in some order that I think was important. The first thing to do in terms of loving your child 
is to be filled with the Spirit. Turn with me to Ephesians 5.18. This is the bottom starting point. This is the initial point where if you can't do this, nothing will work. Okay? Nothing will work. You must be filled with the Spirit. Whatever you do, Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And notice, after that, he goes into wives being subject to your husbands, husbands loving your wives, and then even in chapter 6, verse 1, if children are filled with the Spirit, they will obey their parents in the Lord. And verse 4, fathers will not provoke their children. Everything comes from this one thing. Are you filled or not filled with the Spirit of God? Are you, are you submitting to the Spirit of God? That's what this word filled means. Are you day by day, moment by moment, yielding yourself actively to the control and the leading of the Holy Spirit? If not, then your ability to love your husband and love your children will be diminished down to your own human strength, which will utterly fail. The husband and the wife must be filled with the Spirit. You're, you must train your mind and your heart to love God all the time. Everything needs to be God-centered, God-honoring, God-focused, Christ-exalting. If you're not good at that, you'll be bad at child-raising and loving your husband. If you're not good at that right now, you must start learning to be filled with the Spirit moment by moment. And as, I, as again, you might be asking, well, how do you fill yourself? Is it like you just keep pouring water in until it gets to a certain level? No. The filling of the Spirit is instantaneous. The moment you set your heart to love Christ and obey Him, immediately you are filled. That's what that means. The moment you sin, I don't want to say you lose that, but the moment you sin, you've grieved the Spirit, you must immediately confess to maintain the Spirit-filled um, walk. If you prolong your lack of repentance, meaning you hold longer in terms of your confession, and that sin is there, I will say that you are not filled. You're walking in the flesh. You're walking in your own strength. And there are plenty of ways to know if you're filled. Think about it. The fruits of the Spirit. Are you, do you feel love? You know, do you feel joy? Meaning, you know, you have to listen to your car, you get into it on the, in, during traffic, and you ask yourself, okay, right now, am I feeling joyful? And you, you say, no, I feel tired and weary and dreary. Then you have to tell yourself, I need to repent. I should be thankful that I'm sitting in a car right now in the, in, in the middle of traffic where I can turn the vents inward and not breathe all that carbon monoxide and have air conditioner to make it cool and, 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 and it's car and the gas money to get to work and even a work that I can go to to provide money, you must start thanking God. Peace. Okay? Do you feel peace? Or do you feel anxious? The moment you feel anxious, you are no longer filled with the Spirit. What, you guys get what I'm trying to say here? How, you have to discern whether or not you're filled with the Spirit by going through all of these general tests. And one of those tests can clear, just simply be going through the list of the fruit of, fruit of, fruit of the Spirit. You know, faithfulness at the end. Self-control. So number one, how do you love one's child? You first begin by being submissive and yielding and fully given over to God, His Spirit, and his word. Number two, how do you love one's child? By hourly devoting yourself as an example of love toward Christ. Your child needs to see with his eyes or her eyes okay, that you love Jesus so much. That you love praying to him. You don't just pray long at mealtime. They, they sense that mom always is praying. And then when they're going to sleep, they see mom praying for them, speaking to, speaking to him, singing to him. You know, I think one of the most precious things that a child can observe of his mom or her mom is her singing praises in a deep, 
in a devotional way to the Lord. And they're not playing, you know, secular music. You know, not um, not um, uh, you know, singing some um, some song about love or whatnot. They, they they see her singing, and not just singing, but they can sense that she's singing devotionally to him. So you begin with spirituality. And then third, providing food and comfort. That's obviously basic. Okay? But you'll see some moms just not feeding their children correctly, not preparing adequately, not cooking. They just open the can and say, eat. You know, plop, 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 and you know, slurp it up and we're done. Or microwave. And you'll see some moms who just don't learn how to cook. They'll say, oh, I'm just not good at it. Well, you're not good at it because you don't see that it's important to learn. You have to learn. Again, when I see my wife and, and, and observe, and whenever she bakes, man, the children get so excited. They're just so excited because it, it smells good. They've participated in it, and they eat it, and they know that this was made from a loving mom. Basic sustenance is not just, you know, handing a protein bar and saying you got your protein, you know, adequate amount of protein for that day. Now just be happy and go play outside. Um, spam. Okay, spam moms. <laughs> spam a lot. Um, number four, emotional support. Oh, you know, I, I thought all moms would be emotionally loving, but I've seen some moms, they're just so hard as a rock. They, they don't love their children in the emotional sense. They're so harsh, they're so unbending, uh, they're so difficult. Uh, the child is scared and afraid. Uh, there's no emotional support uh, and a balance there with discipline and love is just very, very harsh. You know, you would think that every mom who would hold an infant, a newborn in their hand, would just be drawn. And I think every mom does go through it for a few minutes. But if it's not cultivated and worked on, they lose it and they become bitter because now their life is miserable, having to wake up every night to change diapers. So number one, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, an outward devotion and example of love toward Christ. Number three, providing food and comfort. Number four, providing emotional support. And number five, loving children through discipline. Now the Bible has a lot to say about this. Turn with me to Proverbs 13. And I want to clarify many, many things because the scripture again tells us we must discipline. But the application of it oftentimes is misapplied, some abuse their children, some hold back too much. Uh, and there's a lot of, of misapplication of the rod. I mean, is there like a correct way to spank your child? Well, it doesn't say that in the scripture. It just says, don't spare the rod. That means we have to fill up the gap here of that of that unknown, like, what do I do? Some of us came from very, you know, gentle families where they would not hit at all. Some of us came from very strong and abusive dads who struck us every time we did something wrong. Um, I'm not saying either way is right. I'm just saying as, you, as a parent, you need to not decide how that's going to happen. But let's take a look at the text first and what the what the verse says. Okay. Oops. In Proverbs 13, verse 24, it says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. You know, there's a lot here, okay, that we need to um, 
um, let it let let it sink. He who withholds his rod hates his son. So that's basically saying if you don't discipline your children, you are basically hating him. Notice again, there's no middle ground. You either love your child or you hate your child. And you would think that everybody in the Old Testament struck their children and disciplined them. But that's not true. What they went through is no different than what we're going through today. You have lazy parents who don't want to deal with their children's behavior. There's some, there's some cultures, they actually teach this, that they will teach that up to about five years of age, do not strike or discipline your child. Let them be free to do whatever they want. want. And obviously, those cultures do not have the scriptures. And if they do, they are willfully disobeying this text. Again, there's no middle ground. Meaning at that time, there were parents who didn't want to take the time and energy to discipline their son. Because notice the last word here. It talks about diligence. Because disciplining your children takes a lot of diligence. And the idea here is, striking him the moment he does wrong is not discipline. Striking him the moment he does wrong is actually revenge. You, you were uh, upset at what he did. You wanted to uh, you know, knock him over and then make him realize you should never do that again because daddy's upset. The rod is for the father who loves his child. So discipline is never to be out of revenge, out of um, um, being uh, disgruntled, or uh, what's the word? Just uh, you lost your patience. Now, granted, some of you have short tempers, and you're going to explode either on your wife or on your children. You need to learn to. Be, prevent that from happening now and you might think you've got it down and then you have children and you have about maybe one or two hours of sleep for the past four days you're sleep deprived and then you're gonna see how controlled you are with your temper so what do we learn from this text you see the aspect of love the aspect aspect of diligence it's never to be done because they upset you and they annoy you the idea here is the father wants to instill upon his child a certain behavior that fits someone who claims to be a believer. And he realizes that it's not just one strike or two strike, it's, it's multiple. Not all at once, it's consistent. Children's behavior takes time to change. They will constantly edge toward that which is wrong. You must constantly restrain them from going too far and letting them, letting them learn to withhold their emotional um, impulses. Look at Proverbs 22. Proverbs chapter 22. Verse 15. Proverbs 22, verse uh, 15. It says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Children will be foolish. Notice the phrase bound up. It's like tightly wound in a child's heart. They are born foolish. There are grown men and women who are still bound with foolishness. The only remedy now as a sinner, as a baby who was born in sin, in terms of removing that foolishness, is not the gospel. It's the rod. The rod which will open the door to the what? The gospel. Because a foolish man will not heed the gospel. Fools will reject the truth. Fools will turn their eyes away from the truth and and according to the book of Proverbs, they will lift up their neck, their eyes with stiff neckness. Their eyes are lofty. They think they're right when they are absolutely what? Wrong. You cannot give your child who is a fool the gospel and expect the gospel to somehow unwind all of that tension of folly in their heart. 
A child who is converted was someone who was adequately prepared by the Holy Spirit through the parent with the rod. It says the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. So now you see the goal of discipline. It's not even to just just change their behavior so that they can make you happy. It's so that they can be no longer a fool who rejects God. You want that folly far from them so that they as a child can grow up to become wise and when they listen to the gospel to, uh, about the love that you have for your father, they will wisely see that that is the right thing to do. But now you see where the hatred comes from. When the father will not discipline or when the mom will not discipline their child, they hate the child so much that they don't care if their child grows up as a fool. And the moms don't realize how sad okay, that they're going to be when their grown child is a walking time bomb of folly. You know, you can love your child by feeding them, singing to them, be filled with the Spirit, giving them emotional support, but none of that will actually prevail to be of use unless you drive that foolishness out of that what? Out of that child. Then all the other things you're trying to do will start making sense to the child. They will receive it and you'll see the effects of that. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Here, uh, again, I think this is referring more to older children, maybe teenagers or junior high school students in, in that age, preteens. Because it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to what? To wrath. Okay. It's amazing that Paul would tell this culture where fathers almost had absolute authority you know, over their child. And the believers, the men who are believers now in this church, who are used to ex exercising that supreme authority of their children, are now told, you must not do this because if your child is upset for whatever reason and you cause that, it is your fault you are sinning. Do not provoke your children. Now, you have, again, you have to ask this question, well, how do you provoke a child to anger? Well, you realize that you can't really provoke a, a four-year-old to anger because they just fear you. They'll just try to please you. you know, they might get angry because you just took away their PlayStation or whatever phone from them, but ultimately they're not going to be like seething with wrath. It's referring to children who are a little bit more grown, and something that you do as a parent upsets them. And they're burdened with this anger. It just burns inside. And you're provoking them. You are causing them to be angry. I mean, you can come up with different scenarios where, you know, you're, you're like you know, the hover parent, you, know, you hear about that, the helicopter parent, the child is so, it feels so stuffy that they're just like, Mom, just, just please, you know, give me some room. To a dad who thinks he knows everything, where the, when the child brings up something, the dad immediately just cuts them, and then halfway through the sentence says, No, they're just, they're just, they're just that. Guy, go to your room. You know, daddy knows best. And, and it's like they're trying to say something, and then you know, see the scripture doesn't say how exactly they're going to be what angry. You know, this is where books really come in handy because when people write these books, they'll give you all these scenarios, and you might relate to one of them. You might be blind to the fact that maybe your breath upsets them. You know, you don't brush your teeth properly, and when you talk to them, you know, it spits out. 
See, when they're little babies, they think it's funny. You know, they're like, Daddy, you're, you're a breath bank, you know, and, and, you know, Ezra does that to me sometimes. And then I go, come here, and I go, ah, you know, he's like, stop! But he doesn't walk away, like, seething with anger. He walks away thinking he's going to do that on Silas <laughs> and try to imitate that to, to the other children. But can you imagine when he grows up and I don't change that and I'm meeting his friends and I've just got this stench and, then, and then amongst their friends, they're like, man, your dad's breath. And now he's all embarrassed. And then, dad, why don't you? And then he's upset. And I'm just like, you know, just, I'm your dad. Just accept me as who I am. Blah, 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 you know, and you guys, can you guys relate with that, that example? Not that particular example, but the idea that there's things that your parents do that just drives you, up, drives you mad. See, they change. The scripture doesn't say how this occurs. It's saying to the dad, think, what is it that you're doing that's provoking them to what? anger. Moms too. And I realized, you know, um, you got to really repent from that idea that, you know, you know, it's hard to teach old dogs new tricks. I've committed in my heart never to allow that philosophy to become my driving motto. Because I realized my children change, I have to change with them. I have to adjust to them, you know. Um, when they're infants, I have to adjust to the infant lifestyle. When they become two or three and they're talking like really cute baby language, I gotta adjust to that lifestyle. Ian and Lydia are now getting becoming preteens now. I gotta adjust to that. You know, um, I can't stay the same. You know, I I I want to just be just chi. You know, just what I've developed all these years. I just want to ride the tide and just surf all the way into the shore, but I realize if I do that, I'm going to be upsetting my family. Now, it's not like they're going to call me out because they respect me as a dad, but I realize that they could hold bitterness in their what? Heart. Small things. You know, whatever it might be. And, and, and this is where you have to realize your children are tender, and if they are angry at you, you've offended the Spirit of God. Why? The Holy Spirit is sensitive. Jesus is sensitive. God is tender, kind, gentle. You know, you look at Israel and how many hundreds of years would pass before God would strike them to reveal His kindness. And here you are getting upset in a few seconds of folly in front of you. The word provoke in the Greek, it means to, to make resentful. That takes time to develop because of your foolishness, the blindness that you have. So it says here, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in two ways, discipline and instruction of the Lord. Notice the command, bring them up. Okay? You can't let them grow. You got to bring them up. Does that make sense? If you leave them, they will grow, but grow the wrong way. You got to cultivate them and bring them up in doing two things. Okay? Um, bring them up, the word bring them up has to do with like, nourishment and providing food. You know, in the physical sense, but the idea is you would bring them up and then you would um, discipline them. The word discipline here is nuthasia, where we get the word nutheteo, nuthetic counseling or admonishment, uh, reproof. That's why the English word is discipline. You would confront them about their sin okay? and instruction. Instruction. You have to teach them. Okay. Not chide them. You have to instruct them. Do this because the Bible says this. Do that because the Bible says that. 
go here because the Bible says go there. Don't go there because the Bible says don't go there. You need to be a teacher. So this is where the moms come in because you will be with the child more in terms of the hours of the day than the father. And you have to be, as it says in Proverbs 31, a woman whose, whose mouth contains knowledge. You know, in one sense, the wife has to be a better theologian than the husband. Because who's going to teach that child theology? The dad? No. Nope. Yeah, one, one or twice at church by the pastor. But you're going to be with that child 24 hours 7. You need to be instructing them how to apply theology, how to view God, how to think of God, how to react to God, how to understand their conscience before God. And no child can do this on their own. You need to instruct them. And with different children, you got to do it differently. Let's say that your first child, it works fine with this method, and second child, you realize you got to change the whole what? Curriculum. And it's tiring. But you have to do that. Discipline. How do you discipline someone? Well, admonishment is one way, but it requires patience, love. But most importantly, discipline requires consistent, enduring repetition. Okay? Consistent, enduring repetition. Basically, you keep at it until you see not a change of behavior, but a change of behavior revealed by a change of attitude. And this is where you'll be good. You'll have to learn to read your child's face and his tone of voice until you sense that there is repentance. You don't stop the discipline. The pain, okay, the pain is now what changes them. The pain of the affliction of the rod stops them and wakes them up. Okay? The, the beating does not change the behavior. Understand that. This is where people get it wrong. You don't beat them unto godliness. That's, that's wrong. That's called abuse. The idea of disciplining them is getting their attention. They're in this folly, so you will strike them so that they'll realize if I continue in folly, it's going to be painful, so they're going to associate folly with pain, not godliness and pain. So because they don't want the pain, they stop their folly, they'll open their ears to you, now you have to instruct them. So there's the negative aspect, which is the painful part, and then, the, and then there's the positive instruction. And did you know from my, this is, this is, obviously this is not in the scripture, but as a parent I've observed that when I help my child get out of their uh, emotional frenzy, they are actually happy. Because I, I observe this, even though we say that children are born sinners, yes, but we have to understand children are born with the sweetest conscience. They're really delicate. They want to please you. They feel bad when they do something wrong. You can make a baby cry just by looking at or, or a child about three or four years old, just looking at them saying, you did this, didn't you? And they'll just start weeping. So I realize when they're upset at something or when they're angry or when they're trying to be really, really disobedient, inside they know it's wrong and they're, they are, they're frustrated because they don't know why they can't stop. And then you discipline them, and they wake up, and then they, they feel the sense of like relief, like, whew, like, thank you, Dad, for making me stop. Now, obviously, they're not going to say that. Like, Dad, yeah, I just lost self-control, and I, I don't know, I, it's like a drug, you know, I was like, you know, but thank you, Dad, so much, snapping me out of that. You know, they're not going to say that, but they will feel the sense of relief, and then they start repenting they'll say sorry and they'll then you start seeing tears of repentance not tears of pain and then the child learns okay how to control their wretched impulses and they're happy uh, I've seen some ch um, children where they, they don't know how to do it and they start doing this they start grabbing their fist and they start shaking it 
and they start screaming. And, and it's kind of like half angry at their mom, but you can tell they don't want to do that. But the parent just doesn't do it right. They'll either yell at the child, make them really upset or afraid, or they'll knock them silly. They, don't, they want the parent to help them. Now, this is just from my you know, background as, uh, of raising children. I don't want to get into any specifics. That's my way of raising children that might not be yours. But by principle, I realize that discipline produces a happy child when you do it right. You know, with uh, Ian and Lydia now, I realize they're seven, six and seven, and discipline doesn't work. Um, I mean, the, the physical part. Uh, we have to now give them verses so that the Bible verses itself will bring a restraining order uh, in, their, in their heart. What, at what age should you stop this rod? Again, the scripture doesn't say, but I think it's, I think it's a little bit different for children, but when they get too old, it's not right. You know, at, at a certain age, it's just not right to hit them. It's like you're beating them then. Uh, I would reserve it for small children who don't understand language too well, but they understand the universal language of what? Of the, of the sting, okay? Uh, but see, this is where a mom needs to be able to do this you know, without losing her cool, without losing self-control, without becoming depressed, that all she does is speak to her children. I had one wife, one uh, sister in Christ, uh, my friend's wife, tell me, I just need to get out of the house because all I do is speak gibberish to my kids. I, I need to speak to an adult. <laughs> no, I understand that. I, and I felt bad, but it, it was kind of sad to hear that, 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 she, that she feels frustrated. Now, I don't know, her, she, she does love her children, but it's just like that's not what you want to hear sometimes. You want to see a mom who is fully in love, you know, and, and happy with the position God has given to her as a full-time mom. There's more to say, but I'll hold it there, uh, and then we'll look at the word.